You've tuned in to Larger Than Life with Pastor Ron Hint of Calvary Chapel, Houston. Here's a preview from Pastor Ron of today's message. God will place people in our life that he wants us to disciple. Uh, God doesn't expect us to disciple a, a throng of people, right? Oh, I got to disciple the, the masses. No, no. He just, he, God's going to put someone in your life. Now, if you're a parent, you automatically should be discipling your children, right? You're discipling them. You're teaching them the truth of God's Word. You're discipling them. But God will put other people in your life in that you're pouring out, and God will be people putting in your life that you receive from. No matter where you are in your faith journey, you can be a disciple. You can share your story of what God has done in your life with those that surround you. In today's message, Pastor Ron will remind you to be open to discipling other people and allowing other people to preach to you and serve you. God is not going to ask you to do something He doesn't want you to do, and He isn't going to put you in a situation that you can't grow from. So, who can you share the love of Jesus Christ with today? Well, let's join Pastor Ron in the book of Acts chapter 18 with today's edition of Larger Than Life. Acts chapter 18, if you would. Acts chapter 18, and uh, let's begin with prayer. Oh, Lord, how we desperately need you. Our world is just getting darker and darker, which just reminds us that you're coming soon. In fact, when we read the book of Revelation, it's literally physically pitch black in this planet just before you come back. And then your brilliance will permeate the canopy of blackness and darkness, and your glory will shine, and every eye will see that you are Lord. So we're looking forward to that time. Lord, we know that you're coming to rapture your church first. We want to be ready. And when we see these signs, like the Bible says, these are the birth pangs, the beginning. And so, Lord, we know your coming is soon. We want to be ready. And Lord, as we continue now our study in the book of Acts, we pray that we would continue to grow, that we might be your disciples. And as we look at discipleship today, we want to be those who are discipled and those who are discipling others. So teach us again according to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. We all say amen. So again, we've entitled this study Momentum, and that's what we see here constantly through the book of Acts. And beginning in chapter 13, we saw the first missionary outreach. Paul went on his first missionary endeavor, and now currently we find ourselves coming to the end of Paul's second missionary tour. Um, he's reached throughout Asia Minor, throughout the continent of Europe. Uh, we saw in our last study in the first 17 verses, he was in Corinth over in Greece. So now as we pick up in verse 18, and we're going to go all the way to the end of the chapter, Paul will come to Ephesus, and then he's going to return and report to the church in Jerusalem, and finally return where he took off, and that is Antioch. But our subject matter this morning, and really the title of our message is discipleship. Uh, you know, Jesus said in the Great Commission, go therefore and make disciples. This was Paul's passion. This is Paul lived for. And of course, it should be our passion as well. Now think about this. Paul uh, would often liken, of course, he used athletic terms all the time, but he likened the Christian life to running a race. And, and the book of Hebrews, of course, tells us it's not a sprint, but it says run the race with endurance. So if we are to think about the Christian life, it's like a marathon, right? We're running and walking for Jesus until he takes us home. But when we come and we talk about the gospel, sharing our faith and discipleship, that is more like a relay race. In other words, we're to be discipled and growing, but we're always supposed to be constantly passing the baton to someone else who will receive it and pass it on to somebody else. So you keep that in mind as we're going to be moving through this passage. But understand this, when it comes to discipleship, um, really, it's, it's not a solo effort. Somewhere in our life, someone was involved in our life, discipling us, answering our questions. And God wants us to not stop being disciples. We want to constantly grow. But he also wants us giving out to other people as well. And this is what we find in this passage. We're going to see here Paul uh, continuing to disciple Priscilla and Aquila. And they, in turn, disciple a man by the name of Apollos. So that's kind of where we're going in these verses. We've given you an outline, you know, so you can take some notes. But we're just dividing it into those two sections, the discipleship, of Priscilla and Aquila, and the discipleship of Apollos. 
Now we begin with this power couple in verses 18 through 23. And verse 18 begins, so Paul still remained a good while. Now, what's it talking about? A good while where? Well, that's referring to just the last passage, right? The first 17 verses. He's in Corinth. And we noted that Paul stayed a year and a half in Corinth. That's a long time, uh, more than Paul has stayed anywhere up until this point. And the Lord encouraged him back in verse 10. said, Paul, you're going to be here a while for I have many people in this city. And it was good that Paul stayed there because it was a very decadent city. Remember, we talked about that as well. So Paul would remain a good amount of time here. And it's here also, we noted, that Paul wrote his book or his letter to the Roman church. And of course, we're currently looking at the book of Romans. Now understand, Paul wrote a lot of letters while he traveled. But because he stayed in Corinth a good long time, he penned his masterpiece. It's really a theological masterpiece because it deals with so many doctrines of the faith, and that's the book of Romans. Now, moving on, we read, then he took leave of the brethren. So he now, after a year and a half, he leaves Corinth, and he sailed for Syria. Now, why Syria? Well, Syria is actually a province at this time, and that's where the church of Antioch is where he and his team launched from. So at this point, it's Paul's intention now to really wind down his second missionary outreach and report to the church in Jerusalem and then report back to Antioch. And he'll stop at a few places along the way. But notice who he takes with him. He's now leaving Corinth, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. Now, we met them back in verse 2 And they were of the same trade as Paul. Paul was, of course, a tent maker. That's how he supported himself while he was a missionary. And God brought them together, and Paul was able to disciple them. And, of course, for a year and a half, by the way, and the early church met in Priscilla and Aquila's home. So this is a dynamic duo, a grace team, you might call them. And now, at this time, think about this. They now leave everything. They were first run out of Rome, where they settled in Corinth. They meet up with Paul. They're discipled by Paul a year and a half. But now they're leaving everything behind to follow Paul, which tells us two things. First of all, it tells us about the heart of the apostle Paul. Paul had a heart to always disciple other people. He always kept an eye out for people who were teachable. And, you know, he took with him Barnabas. He took with him Silas. He found Timothy along the way at one of the cities that he was sharing the gospel, took Timothy with him, you know. And here he finds these people. This is Priscilla and Aquila. By the way, where did Paul learn that from, you know, taking people with him? Well, I would say it was from Jesus, right? Jesus, that's how Jesus, Jesus chose disciples and poured his life into them. We even call them disciples, By the way, as Jesus discipled those men, how did he do it? Did he he teach them a 10-week course? Or did he send them away to seminary and then they return? No. Now listen, all those things are helpful, whether it's seminary or, you know, discipleship courses and so forth. But you know how Jesus trained his disciples? Very simply, this is what he did. Follow me. He said, follow me. Just follow me. Come with me everywhere I go. Now, we don't have the opportunity always to take someone with us everywhere we go, or does anybody have that opportunity to do that? But listen, that's the best way to do it. That's how Jesus did it. That's how Jesus trained people. He said, first, Jesus did. He did all these things. You guys watch. I'll do, you watch. And then after a while, after about a year or so, Jesus then sent the disciples out, and they would do, and they would report back to him. And then in the final phase, he just launched them out. So when Paul found someone who was faithful, who was willing, who was teachable, like this couple, he took them. Now, let me also say this about discipleship. First of all, you might say there's general discipleship. And I believe this is what should come from a pulpit every single Sunday, right? You have a man of God who's going to teach the word of God, And he's teaching it properly so people, in a general way, are getting discipled right out of God's word. But then we have personal discipleship. And first of all, we need to be feeding ourselves from the word of God, amen, every single day. 
But then we should also, not only receiving, we should be pouring into somebody else's life. Now, let me say this. You can only disciple so many people on a personal level. I mean, think about Jesus again. Jesus, you might say, had a pulpit ministry, right? He, he taught crowds of people. But really, on a personal level, Jesus just had 12 guys, right, that he poured his life into. And then even within the 12, he had an even inner circle of Peter, James, and John that he poured even more time into. And, and all of that is to say this. God will place people in our life that he wants us to disciple, God doesn't expect us to disciple a, a throng of people, right? Oh, I got to disciple the, the masses. No, no. He just, he, God's going to put someone in your life. Now, if you're a parent, you automatically should be discipling your children, right? You're discipling them. You're teaching them the truth of God's word. You're discipling them. But God will put other people in your life in that you're pouring out, and God will be people putting in your life that you receive from. Now, for me, I actually do have a pulpit ministry, so it's a little bit different. But if I talk about my personal time, I have a group of leaders, leaders in our church, deacons and so forth, that I do work with and disciple regularly. And on a personal level, those even closer to me that I have an opportunity to interact with even more. But, but here's the thing. When we think of discipleship, we often think of a program, you know, a 10-week program or a, uh, maybe a, a course you take or uh, a series on a DVD program, or a book. I mean, their Christian bookstores are full of hundreds of books dealing with the subject of discipleship. And again, all of those are, are good. But again, if we could simplify it, again, if we follow Jesus, the best thing to do is this. You find someone who knows less than you, and you just share with them what you know. And God will bring those people in your life. And you should be always receiving yourself, Right? But, but God will give it, I mean, listen, did you know that people get saved, and this has happened many times, people get saved, and after they get saved, they get like a Bible and maybe some materials. I've seen people take what we give them right after they're born again and sharing that with their family the next day. They're, they're just saved, and yet what are they doing? They're discipling in a sense. They're saying, well, here's some materials I got. Well, let's check that. Hey, let me show you this. Or, hey, this week I learned this. I've only been saved like a month, but I learned this at church, and they're sharing that. That's finding someone who knows less than you do. That's great. Now, as I said, there are two things here I see here. One, I see the willingness and the passion of the Apostle Paul to take others with him like he did Priscilla and Aquila and many others. But we also see the eagerness and the willingness of Priscilla and Aquila to do whatever it took to be disciple, right? I mean, they willingly left everything because they wanted more of Jesus. Sure, Paul, we'll follow you, we'll pack up here, then we'll come with you. Now, I remember having a very something very similar to that. That doesn't mean that it has to happen the same way, but I had something similar to that in the fact that I got born again about 42 years ago, and after I got saved, shortly after that, someone was starting a new work. They asked me to be part of it, and I was like, yeah, I'm, I'm in, I'm there. So I was there, and, and it was you know three to four times a week. And uh, the thing is, I lived an hour away. So I was like, no problem, man. I'm commuting because I, I didn't care. Well, an hour away, that, no big deal for me, man. I was like, I'm, I'm growing. It's so funny. Sometimes I, I meet people that, you know, say, man, I wish I could come to your church, but, you know, it's just, it's just too far away. And they were visiting here. I said, well, how far away do you live? Man, we're like 20 minutes away. Right? I, I'm thankful, thank you for laughing. Because that's what I think too, but it's, it's okay. I understand. You know, but it's not too bad. But because I know there are some people in our church who travel an hour. And I get that because I did that. I did that. When I first got saved, I got saved at Calvary Coast to Mesa at Pastor Chuck Smith. I drove an hour every day. Then there was a new work starting even a little bit further. I'm like, I'm part of it. So what happened is this. I knew I needed to be part of that work, and I had a condo, so I put the condo for sale. But it wasn't selling. Not one year, not two years, and I'm still commuting. Finally, what I said, I rented it out, and I got an apartment to be near that new work that I was starting. And then I had to leave the company that I was working for that had a company car and everything. It's like, here it is. And I went and got myself a really awesome used Pinto. <laughs> Man, that was an awesome car. Really? Some of you are going, what's a Pinto? You're right, because I, I, has anybody ever in the last decade, longer than that, ever seen a Pinto on the road? 
if you had, oh, that's amazing. That's, hey. But I'll tell you what, you know, sometimes people get the car, they'll get, they get older in life, and they go, I want to get one of the first cars I have. I guarantee you, I do want, not want a Pinto. <laughs> you can look it up on YouTube, you know what it is. It's, just a, it's a driving hazard. Anyway. <laughs> but, but I was so thankful. So what I did is I, I basically left everything to do that work, to be discipled. I rearranged my life. And I think that that's, that's worth it. It was worth it to me. I saw it. I'm going to put Jesus first, you know. So again, that's what Priscilla and Aquila are doing. They left everything to be discipled by Paul because they love God so greatly. It's like, whatever we can do, man, we want to learn more. We want to be used by God to the max. And again, the early church met in their home in Corinth. So that was turned over to somebody else. And we're going to see that God uses them in the next city. Now, moving on, we also read this, that having taken Priscilla and Aquila with them, Paul had his hair cut off at Crenshria. That's actually a seaport in Corinth. So right there before taking off, for he had taken a vow. Now, what kind of vow would cause Paul, at the end of it, to cut off his hair? Well, this is a reference to a Nazarite vow. Now, a Nazarite has nothing to do with a Nazarene. A Nazarene is a person from Nazareth who may or may not be a Nazarite. You're like, hmm? Nazareth is with an A. Nazarite is with an I. Nazarite. Okay, Ron, what is a Nazarite? Well, what he's dealing with is a Nazarite vow. What is a Nazarite vow? Glad you asked that. So a Nazarite vow was simply a vow of consecration. It was typically a 30-day vow where you know, an individual will abstain from cutting their hair. They let their hair grow long. I mean, I can't imagine how long it grows just in 30 days, but they let their hair grow long. And then they abstain from anything from the vine, grapes, raisins, wine, and so forth. Now, there are some cases where people had or made a lifelong Nazarite vow. Such people are uh, Samson in the Old Testament, right? John the Baptist in the New Testament. And they, they never cut their hair. But in this vow, you, you abstain from those things. And then at the end of the 30-day vow, they would cut their hair off and they would give it to God as an offering. You know, I'm, I, And they did this as a way of focusing on God, abstaining from the flesh, centering their thoughts on the Lord. Now you say, why would, why would people do this? Well, the Mishnah, which is the Jewish codification of the law, stated that in most cases, people would do this out of a deep gratitude for special deliverance or special blessing from the Lord, just thanking him. Now, think about that. Ask yourself, does the Apostle Paul have reasons to give thank for special deliverance or blessing? The answer is absolutely. Again, if you've been following us for the last two years, even going back to his his first missionary journey, but this second one, he's been beaten and left in a dungeon. He's been stoned before. He's dealt with riots. His life has been threatened. And yet all along, God has sustained him. God has been giving him constant deliverance and special blessing. In light of that, somewhere down the line, Paul just took this Nazarite vow to express his appreciation to God. Now, understand, by Paul doing that, he's not abdicating the grace of God. He's not nullifying God's work of grace through the works of the law. This vow was not a matter of earning your salvation. It was simply a statement of gratitude for God's sustaining guidance. And so understand, Paul was a Jew, right? He was still a Jew. He was a complete Jew, a Hebrew Christian. But this was a common practice amongst Jews and even Jewish believers. So Paul was simply expressing in his culture a way to give thanks to the Lord. That's not part of our culture, right? We, we don't do this. Now, if for some reason you want to abstain from something and cut your hair, go for it. Or some of you are already doing what I do. You just, it's been done with it, right? God has a way of doing that. (laughs) But let's move on. Now, Paul came to Ephesus. So he's now working his way back home, but he stops in Ephesus, and he left them there. That's Priscilla and Aquila. But he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. So again, here's Paul, 
and he's trained Priscilla and Aquila well enough, accurately enough. He's worked alongside of them for well over a year and a half. And so now he's going to be moving on. He's going to leave them here in Ephesus. Now he'll come back and visit him. We'll see that in future studies. But he's going to leave them here because now they're able to stay there and now disciple others, which we're going to see, by the way. Now, he himself, though, is stayed there a little bit, and he enters the synagogue, and he reasons with the Jew. And again, this was always his MO, going to the synagogue, present the Old Testament scriptures, showing that Jesus is the Christ, the Messiah, and people would come to the Lord. And people did. In fact, it says in verse 20, when they asked him to stay longer time with them, he didn't consent. So they were excited. They got born again, and they're saying, Paul, stay longer. Don't go on, you know. But Paul could do that knowing that he had two well-trained people who could continue the work and help disciple this new beginning, this new church. And so Paul was going to move on. But I love the fact that they say of Paul, Paul, stay. Paul was such a blessing to people. Now listen, he he had a strong personality, right? He told people the truth. But he also loved Jesus Christ. And because of that, he was very endearing. And because of that, people wanted to be around him. And you know what? Haven't you found that to be true? Don't you want to be around people who are bold for Christ? Don't you want to be around people who talk about the things of God, who stimulate your walk in Christ? I love to be around people like that, right? And so would to God we would be that kind of believer, that when people come around us, we're not just, we don't have carnal conversation or just worldly conversation. We talk about the things of God, and we encourage them in their walk. People want to be around that. So the Ephesians said, Paul, stay longer. But, verse 21, he took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this feast, or this coming feast, in Jerusalem. But I will return again to you. That would be his third missionary journey, God willing. And he sailed from Ephesus. Now, notice this is another interesting thing. Paul says, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem. Again, is Paul reverting back to Judaism? He's saying, I got to get there and offer up my Passover lamb. No. Paul spoke in every single synagogue telling the Jews, you no longer have to keep the feast. You no longer have to offer up a sacrifice. Jesus fulfilled the law. So why is Paul going back there during the celebration of the feast? One answer, Romans 10.1. This is where Paul expresses his heart. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. Paul, though he was called the apostle to the Gentiles, longed to have his brethren come to Christ. That's why he always shared in every synagogue. And what better time to be in Jerusalem when there's an upcoming feast? This is the time where Jerusalem will be packed. See, there's only one temple for the Jew, just one in Jerusalem. Synagogues, they're everywhere. They're all around the world. They were back then. They are today. But he would go there because for a Jew, they'd go to the place of the temple, the place of sacrifice, the place where they are told they have to go there, you know, to celebrate the various feasts, the Feast of Passover or the Feast of Pentecost. And Paul wants to get there at this time because this is now the greatest opportunity because there are more Jews packed in one place than any other time of the year. And by the way, that's why one of the reasons, not the only, the prophetic reason is because it was Pentecost fulfilling the prophecy of Christ, but also it happened on Pentecost because the place was packed and Peter filled to the Holy Spirit stands in front of the whole crowd, shares Christ and 3,000 souls are saved. So Paul is going there not to, you know, to offer up a sacrifice, but to present Jesus Christ. But notice the little note here, and I think it's important to note, <laughs> Verse 21, he says, I'm going to go there, God willing. That was more than a slogan to Paul. That was a way of life. Thanks for joining us here today on Large Than Life as we go through the book of Acts. There may be no better place in the Bible to learn about what it's like to be a disciple. Virtually every verse is a glimpse into the life of these men who had followed and been taught by Jesus personally. 
but now they are left behind after Jesus' ascension to preach and teach the Word of God. They must continue without the physical support of Jesus there to help. That must have been a humbling experience, but how blessed we are that they rose to that occasion. Have you ever felt like that? You finished college or a certification class, and now without the support and protection of the classroom, you have to go out into the world and apply your new skill. It's a little scary. I imagine it must have been something like that for the disciples, too. Here at Larger Than Life, a ministry of Calvary Houston and Pastor Ron Hint, we want you to know and experience the incredible, awesome love of God. And on our website, ltlradio.org, you'll find so many ways to learn about Him. You can find a link to download our mobile app at ltlradio.org and subscribe to the Larger Than Life podcast. This will give you access to every single one of Pastor Ron's messages and many other encouraging resources. Once again, that website is ltlradio.org. LTLradio.org. We're at the end of our time today, but we'll be back with more on Larger Than Life.